we actually wanted the seven inch to be blue, but because this, the cellophane was red, the printer just made them red. Like that was how little we had, you know, how little control we had in, what, in, in our final product. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000 punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. Sicko was an American rock group from Seattle, Washington, formed in 1991. Exceptionally, the three-piece pop-punk group maintained a constant membership for every recording as a band. This lineup was Denny Bartlett, Ian Hernandez, and Josh Rubin. Sicko released four full-length albums and five seven-inch EPs, as well as a retrospective CD with unreleased and rare material, a release demo, and a tour video. They also appeared on approximately 14 compilations on labels such as Lookout Records and Liberation Records. The vast majority of their recorded output was recorded by Kurt Block, or Blotch, that's one of those two, of the Fastbacks and released the Seattle-based punk label Empty Records. One EP and the retrospective CD were released on Mutant Pop Records. They had three songs released on the Xbox game Project Gotham Racing 2 alongside artists like The Flaming Lips and Princess Superstar. I don't know who Princess Superstar is, but Flaming Lips, that's pretty cool. I heard about Sicko, obviously, 20 or so years ago by Alan Rappaport, who uh, I interviewed him many interviews ago, if you want to check it out. It's a great one. It's uh, Alan was the guy who introduced me and my buddies to a lot of the music that we grew to love and still listen to this day. And Sicko was one of these bands, so every time we'd come in, he would pretty much just like stockpile us with sicko albums. It's kind of like that scene in High Fidelity where Jack Black is walking around and giving that guy just piles of records and just telling him everything will be okay. It's how I felt when uh, we would go to Flipside Records and Alan was Jack Black. I got in touch with Josh through many barriers of Facebook. I messaged their Facebook group. I think I talked to either Ian or Denny and they were like, what's this about? And uh, I was like, well, I want to talk about the late 90s scene. And they're like, hmm. And it was just kind of like a bit of a waiting process. And finally I got Josh's email when they figured out I was legit and uh, I wasn't trying to, I don't know, maybe sell them something or I don't know. There was a couple of hiccups trying to get him on the phone, but we eventually got to it and I uh, had a really nice chat. And uh, this is what we talked about. Alan Rapport being the number one fan. Josh's Misfits t-shirt changing the course of his life. Empty Records who actually did their album artwork, having their stuff released digitally on Red Scare Records. Red Scare is actually uh, run by Toby and Brendan, and Brendan is the former singer of Slapstick, uh, the Broadways, and currently, kind of currently, Lawrence Arms. And I also interviewed him about like th- th- tw- 10 or so interviews ago, which you should check out as well. Switching their instruments during their set, the reunion show they played recently, Frank from the Mr. T Experience, and a ton more. This week's episode is brought to you again by Nishimni Creek Brewing Company, bringing the punk rock ruckus to liquid form, brewing up lip smacking, palate crack and IPAs and sours, robust dark beers, and a healthy mix of classic easy drinkers. Nishimni Creek beers are available in NJ, PA, DE, and MD. It's New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland. The Chimney Creek will celebrate their 7th anniversary on Saturday, June 8th with a free show at their main brewing facility and taproom in Croydon, PA. This will be featuring Dave Haas, Modern Life is War, School Drugs, and Fire in the Radio. This means that this will be happening a, uh, in about a week, so if you live close to Croydon, PA, then you should go enjoy the festivities. If you'd like to support the podcast, it helps by buying merch or donating or sharing this just so more people find it. Uh, it also helps if you want to sponsor this. If you'd like to do that, just email me at thiswasthescene at gmail.com. If you want to buy some shit or donate, go to thiswasthescene.com, and there's some donate buttons on the top. And if you scroll down, there's merch. Um, if you have ideas for some cool merch that you'd want to wear, let me know. And yeah, again, thank you for all the people who have donated or bought merch. Uh, you are super fucking kick-ass, and I really appreciate you a lot. Two more things real quick is I have an animation company you should check out. It's drive80.com. If you have a logo you want animated, you should hire me to do this, or you can get an explainer video, and I'll explain what your company does in 60 seconds or less. It's typically great for tech companies who uh, who have a real problem with this. 
And I also have a web comic on Instagram called Daily Bread. You can look it up by checking out the handle or searching for the handle Your Daily Bread. And I just do daily comics. I also have a couple books out and some shit if you want to check it out. Feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. Thanks for giving me some time, even though it took us, whoa, when was the last time we tried to do this, like January? Yeah, yeah, I apologize for not making it a couple times. Um, I have a 16-year-old son who is quite impressed that I'm going to be on a podcast. Oh, really? Yeah, so some, some, uh, you know, some points with the younger generation. Doesn't he know about the band though? Does he, you like, <laughs> have you like played him all, one of the many albums and like? Show I make them? it sound. I make it sound much cooler than it was. See, my friends will see it differently. Like you, you know, it's like how you're seeing it, where you're like, yeah, I don't know, but your son's like, that's super cool. And then my friends are gonna be like, holy shit, this is awesome. <laughs> that's that'd be, pretty cool. <laughs> that'd yeah. that's... I t- I text my buddy. I was like, what question would you want to ask Sicko? And he just hasn't gotten <laughs> back to me. I'm like, really, dude? Like. What the, what the fuck? I, like, I never let anybody know who I'm, I'm talking to. But yeah, that's um, funny. So, real quick before we get into, it, I was doing a little research and of uh, just like old albums and things like that. And on your Spotify page, did you know there's a there's like this rap group that's mixed in with you guys? You know, I saw that, and uh, you know, I'm going to contact my lawyer about that, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, in Spotify, they have the number of regular listeners, and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a you know a huge number of regular listeners. I'm like, oh, it's probably the rap guy. It's hilarious, dude. It's called. Yeah. I hit him up because I'm going through all the hits, because like Bad Ear and the Sprinkler were, you know, even though they weren't like MTV things, those were what I think when people listen to Sicko like were top songs, especially. You know, even looking at like the numbers on Spotify, you get like thirty thousand on Bad Ear and Sprinklers. I uh, got like twenty one thousand. But then I hit him up. It's got five thousand like listens to it, and it's just this. So I'm going through it, and this song comes on. I'm like, wait a minute, what is this? <laughs> Man, he's he's riding our coattails. Yeah, seriously. Uh, <laughs> maybe, he's, maybe he's just trying to cross over. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right, man. So. The way um the way I structure the the all these episodes is I like to really go back and kind of see like how you got into music and then transition it into you know getting into the band and you guys touring and any crazy stories that come about and you know how it broke up and really focus on the late 90s into like the early 2000s when um when I was the era where I was really involved in punk rock and I had a band that played in that time and the reason I started this podcast was because I was I wanted to focus on that time because I thought that after after that time period, things got really corporate and everyone was about hairstyles and, and turtlenecks mm. and uh, fashion and shit. And I think that a lot of us were not even thinking about that crap when we were doing this. But you guys were a band, like I said, that was always in heavy rotation in our cars, in our CD players, which people <laughs> remember. But um, do you remember Alan Rappaport from Wayne, New Jersey? Well, of course, Alan is uh, was and may still be the number one sicko fan. Yeah, so he no, and, he okay, go on. Oh yeah, we just saw him. Um, well, now I guess it's a year and a half ago, but he came out for um, Ian Sicko's Seattle Pop Punk Festival, and so it was quite a reunion of the of the old crew, and and uh, Alan was there. No shit, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah he. Uh... He got us. He he introduced us to you guys. He introduced us to you guys, Zoinks, um, his band True Zero before like they broke up. Did you guys ever play a show with them, with True Zero? You know, I think we did when we uh, came through there one time. Um, I seem to think that we did, although I got to tell you, uh, it's a little hazy. Yeah, that's, <laughs> some that's some of, some of the nineties, but um, yeah, Alan was uh, Alan was a true supporter. Yeah, I had him on here early on in this the, when the podcast started because I was focusing strictly on New Jersey and we were talking about because like, he was the guy who introduced uh, me and my friends to a lot of bands that when we were listening to we we go into Flipside where he was working and we you know my friends would want to buy No Effects and Lagwag and and he'd say sure he's like well hold on have you guys checked out Jimmy World have you checked out Mineral here's this band Sicko and he would just broaden our minds to the things that were out there that weren't on the thank you list of the bands that we were listening to well and that's how it was done back then I mean yeah. you know you didn't have Bandcamp and 
it was either your friends or po- pouring through maximum rock and roll to see if there was something that kind of piqued your interest. Yeah. Um, but it really depended on fans telling other people, you know, hey, check these guys out. I know. I wonder if in, I mean, I also have people recommend bands like that, but I'll, I'll kind of stick to my Spotify playlist now. Because I think like the internet, what it's done really well is separate people from having human connection. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, or I, I, I make sure that AI is telling me what to look for. But it does recommend some newer bands that are in my style. But that's what it was back then. And a lot of interviews are, when I talk about how people found new bands and their style, it was the, the thank you list and things like that. But what I want to go back... In, and do this nice little segue here is, you know, go back in time and, and, and tell the people listening, like, how, when you were a kid, what was that, you know, what got you into music and what was that aha moment where you, it really caught your attention and you just couldn't, you couldn't shake it? Well, I, you know, we were, we were raised, um, one of my mom's things was you, you have to play an instrument. So she didn't really care what it was. Um, but even as a eight, nine year old, um, you know, we had to pick something and it's funny. My, my brother picked the banjo for whatever reason. He's a bass player now. Um, he wanted all the girls. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's like, you know, the banjo is just not pulling him in like the bass will. Um, and, uh, I think I tried the violin at one point. Um, and then I happened upon the drums and, you know, for whatever reason, they just made a lot of sense to me. Um, but I remember the first, um, actually my brother was my gateway into a lot of stuff. So first it was heavy metal. And, um, I remember one, one, uh, Christmas he got a uh, blizzard of Oz by Ozzy Osbourne yep. and he got diver down by Van Halen. And I remember, um, you know, the most kind of current thing that I was listening to back then, I think in fifth grade was the Go-Go's were like, you know, I, I really liked the Go-Go's for some reason. Oh, hell yeah. Um, Boy, yeah. Carla, um, all the way. But uh, I remember he would like leave the house and I would steal, I would steal his, you know, cassettes and go into my room and listen to Van Halen. Um, so metal was <clears throat> really my kind of foray into popular music. And that's really what kind of captured my attention. I remember, you know, all those kind of early 80s metal hair bands because I grew up in Southern California. So, you know, as a 16-year-old, we'd drive and go see Poison in the clubs and, and stuff like that. So, really? You you actually saw them play on, like, some Oh, of yeah. Oh, yeah. There was this place in Reseda called the Country Club, and they would often play with Warren. So Poison and Warren were a very common uh, bill. And they were, you know, they were the best thing kind of – in the clubs at, at that time, um, they put on the best show. I mean, it, it was, you know, Poison was a big event. Um, of course, they got, you know, enormously huge. Yeah, um, a little bit. And metal was really it until I was probably about 15 or 16. And I was lucky enough to have my brother go off to college and send back mixtapes of, hey, man, you know, I know we listen to metal back in the day, but you really need to check out this, you know, punk rock stuff. And, um, you know, it was the replacements and X and who's do. And I remember the angry Samoans and Sonic youth were on there. And, you know, I go back and I look at those tapes now and it really was just this catalog of all of the great kind of classic, you know, punk bands of the, of the early eighties and stuff. Um, so I really have to give credit to my brother for, you know, encouraging me on my uh, on my musical journey. Um, so there's two things here I really want to kind of d- dive into. One, first, like, why was it so important for your mom to have you guys play an instrument? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I'm not really even sure where that on her side of the family seems to have played instruments, but I think she just had this idea that, you know, well brought up children, um, you know, that a musical education is part of that. I'm not sure where she happened upon that idea. Out of all the interviews I've done, I've never heard. I, there was one I did where 
um, a, a Doug from this band called The Sleeping, he his sister was big into making him sing and like dance and things like that. And oh, really? Yeah, and uh, that's like she would like lock him in her room, and be like, "You're dancing right." Now. I forget like exactly how it was, but it was, he was like, <laughs> "Really?" Um, it was just just funny hearing these stories when we were younger of how that transitioned through life. Like, you know, I remember my mom would always come home from work or in the morning, she'd always turn the radio on in the morning and she'd come home, she'd put on vinyl and just like sit down in front of a speaker in the dark and just like listen to music. So mm-hmm. it, it, uh, there's this common thread that all of our parents were huge into music. So this is the first time I think I've heard though that someone's parent was like, you have to like play an instrument. I'm so fascinated by this. Yeah, it was just part of the deal growing up in that house. Um but it worked. I mean, you know, both my brother and I continue to play music, you know, even even today. Yeah. Are you still playing drums? Well, I am. Um, I'm playing in a, a little uh, number with Denny from Sicko and his wife. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Yeah. That's... Yeah. They kicked their they kicked their drummer out about uh, eight months ago. And, <laughs> or, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> the drama never I goes lo- away. <laughs> I was a logical second choice. <laughs> That's awesome. That's cool. You guys still live around each other. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, what was the, the other? I had another question though. Shit, I totally forgot it. But I like the transition though of your brother sending music back to you uh, from college. Like, were you like, were you one of those metal guys that were? Oh no, actually, I know what the question is. But like, before I thought about that one, were you like one of the metal guys who was wearing like the jean jacket with like the Cinderella button and all that shit? Do you remember those guys? <laughs> with the uh, the fake sheepskin in yeah. the. Uh... So, you know, where I was from, those were more stoners than the metal guys. Okay. So there was even kind of subgenres of the metal kids, you know. Um, so I did not have the jean jacket, although I had friends who had the jean jacket. <laughs> That's awesome. I remember a kid in my grade who had that. That's why I asked that. Did you, when when he was sending back all that music, you know, again, it, it is a while back when we're talking about deep, but can you kind of remember what what it was about those songs that took you away from, okay, I'm in this genre of music, I'm into metal and Ozzy and all that, but this new stuff isn't metal at all, but it's raw. Like what, what was like the magnet drawing you over that direction? That's an interesting question. I mean, you know, as you said, there was a lot of um, image in some of this stuff. And I think that started to get a little old for me. And I think that what, what really, um, kind of piqued my interest was the accessibility where, you know, you didn't need a big record label and you didn't need some, you know, music publisher or a magazine or a radio station to make you successful at this, that you could just, you know, have your band and your three chords in your garage and, you know, you could get into this and do it yourself. And, um, you know, the speed of the music was certainly, um, you know, appealing to a 17 year old. Um, and just kind of that whole do it yourself. Like, you know, we can just have bands and play shows and it doesn't have to be, you know, metal was so kind of, um, focused on making it and that the AR guy came to your show. And I remember playing in a metal club at the Troubadour, which is a you know yeah. pretty famous club down there. Yeah, I've been there. And, uh, you know, and it was pay to play. Like you actually had to put up money and then try and sell tickets. And of course, no one's buying tickets to your stupid band on a Tuesday. Um, And it just didn't make sense to me. It was just like, this is crazy. It's it's so uh, business oriented. And then the punk rock thing, of course, was, you know, just the opposite of that, that it just didn't matter. It was so kind of unpretentious and um, non-image focused, although you, (laughs) you later learn there's, you know, quite a bit of you know, image orientedness and, you know, what is punk and all these sorts of things going on. Uh, But that was definitely an attraction to me. You know, just the idea that you could do it on your own and have your stupid little band and not have to pay to play. Did you catch that, that it wasn't a a big, you know, it wasn't similar to metal because when you went to, because the source of seeing any band on TV was MTV. And, um, when you would hear these because i remember for me when i would hear these bands i'd go on mtv and during the daytime and there was it was always the same bands on repeat but then towards the end like the midnight era when there was 120 minutes and all that stuff you can actually see bands that you wanted to see that you didn't think was possible but do you think that because it was so hard 
like I, I, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is, you know, you're like listening to them. You said that they weren't like these bands where they're you know in your face and on TV and things like that. Was it because you were looking on MTV and saying, well, wait a minute, where, where the hell are they? Well, it was certainly harder to, you know, see the bands that you liked. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess that's part of it. Um, although it was still pretty hard to come across the content, you know, like we were talking about, it was pouring through little zines and talking to friends and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, when the bands did come through your town, you could actually go talk to them. But I thought it was the coolest thing because... I like the fact that you didn't know what the bands looked like unless they were in the liner notes with photos, and sometimes they just would leave themselves out. So they or they were almost like a mystery, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that almost kind of worked in their favor. I mean, again, this is all speculation, but just well, especially me. the especially the ugly ones. Yeah, yeah. Some of them were definitely not the most. Uh, no, I mean, I remember like you know you'd get your your album and you would pour over every word, you know, because that's all you had yeah. was that one thing and maybe it had an insert and maybe it didn't. And you, you know, you looked at every single picture and every single word. It's so different now. Um, being able to go to, you know, YouTube. I mean, I sound like such an old guy. Um, no, I do the same e- thing. Same but thing. even like, um, like I'm part of some Van Halen, um, you know, Facebook groups or whatever. Oh, wow. And the amount of photos that are available to us now, <laughs> you know, I mean, finding a Van Halen video back in the day, you know, it was impossible. And then all you had was circus magazine or, yeah. you know, um, there's just so much more available to us now. Yeah. It's almost <laughs> to the point where it's, it's so much availability that you just, you're, it's like Instagram, right? You just, you're just like next, next, next. And you're not even sitting there. Cause when you had that one photo online, that's the only thing you can, or not even online, like in a magazine, you, you'd stare at it because you're like, this is all I have. This is all I have. Yeah. yeah. I'm starved for my Van Halen photos. Yeah. <laughs> I totally remember. That. I did that with Sunday Day Real Estate. I was like, this is the one image I have of Jeremy Enoch. This is crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is it a good picture? I don't really know what yeah. he looks like. I don't even care. He's not even very attractive, <laughs> but he, the music makes him a god to me. No, I'm just kidding. That's um, right. That's, that's right. true. So, like, what at this point when your brother's sending all the music back to you, were you in high school? I was in high school. Yep. So, did that transition, like, around this time? Is, is Was there, because were you growing up in the valley? I grew up in I grew up in Simi Valley. Oh my God! Was, yeah, I yeah. Know Valley. Yep. You know Simi Valley? Yeah. I lived in uh, I lived in um, uh, the I lived in the valley of the valley. Uh, I lived in uh, Tarzana and Reseda for a while, or Canoga oh, Park yeah. and Tarzana in t- like 2000, okay. 2001. Yeah. Hey, yeah. do you remember Do you remember a place? Uh, I think it was on Chatsworth called Magic World. I think I do remember this place. Yeah. yeah. Wait, what was, well, wait, what was it? It was like balloons and costumes and magic. Yes. Yeah. Holy shit! Yeah, I, I do just, remember that. Wait, what did did you did you wait did you work there um, when you were in, uh, in high school? Oh, okay. Oh my god. I would listen to the mixtapes driving back and forth to Magic World. Yeah, because that was a bit of a hike going from the valley to Simi Valley. Yeah. Yeah, the one eighteen is that what it took? One eighteen, that's right, or Santa Susana Pass Road. Yep. Yeah, and there was uh, the only thing I remember about Simi Valley was there was. A junkyard there where <laughs> the shark <laughs> and Jaws was the it, that's where they he, he there Bruce that's where he landed. Uh, you know, um, I'm impressed that you remember that. Yeah, there's a there's a sign and there's the entryway and they took the shark and the, the mechanical shark and it's there like in, in this oh, it was there anyway such random <laughs> information. Um, <laughs> so like around this time, like when did you start going to local shows like local punk shows? Well, that was really, um, so maybe senior year of high school, but I really didn't go to that many shows, um, until I got up here to Seattle in, uh, in college. Oh, okay. And, and, you know, it was Seattle in 1989, 1990 was not a punk town. You know, it was a grunge town. Yeah. So, but the grunge guys, you know, I mean, they kind of had a similar thing going in the, in the whole sub pop thing was certainly getting off the ground at that point. Um, and there was just a real music scene. I mean, there was any weekend you wanted to go out, you could find some band to go see. Um, so so like, it was a, it was really good town. 
for that. So, I mean, I remember watching all that from New Jersey because when I started getting to music, Nirvana was like the gateway for me into what I thought was real, <laughs> real music, like raw and like, what is this crazy shit I'm listening to right now? Because I used to listen to Warrant and Poison and all that, and it was so glam and sugary. And I remember, you know, seeing the movie Singles and all the grunge stuff and the, it's the way they portrayed Seattle, like growing up, like going to college there, did you find that it was portrayed the way that you saw it locally? I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I think uh, it was, you know, it was a lot rawer and a lot more kind of, uh, I mean, I don't know if scary is the word, but, you know, more honest and, um, grittier i mean seattle was kind of a gritty town back then it's not you know it's certainly not anymore yeah um and some people would say oh by 89 you know it wasn't the real seattle um but there was definitely more but i mean do you remember when um guns and roses came on the scene and they were like real rock and roll guys and you know yeah. not that i mean and you look at them and they're still pretty glammy even back then <laughs> but there was this real, real difference of like you know these guys have shed this sort of glam image conscious rock thing and now they are just like the real rock and roll guys that's sort of what seattle felt like to me like with the mud honeys and the sound gardens and all those bands you know there was something kind of more authentic and more gritty at least you know yeah in, you know uh, to me yeah um, it was like it was real so like around this time where you're you're surrounded by this whole sound like you know how did you actually get involved in in the band like when did you guys get together well, I, um, you know, my entire uh, adult existence comes down to one Misfits t-shirt um, that I bought when I for very first came to college. And, you know, it's just a classic Misfits t-shirt. And I'm walking across campus maybe second or third day I was in the state. And uh, this guy, Justin, kind of walks by me and, and points at my shirt and says, hey, man, you know, did you see Danzig when he was in town? And uh, we struck up a conversation and a friendship and uh, he was the one who introduced me to Ian and Denny, who had he knew them from Spokane, and they had all moved back here. And those guys were were starting a band. And he mentioned to me that uh, that they were looking for a drummer. Um, and then through the band, I met um, people, you know, future employers, set me on my you know career trajectory, and also led to me meeting and marrying my wife. So oh, it wow. all comes down. To, it all comes down to that one. Um, misfits t-shirt but yeah it was just you know mutual friends and um hearing that they they needed a drummer and you know they're looking for they wanted a, a pop punk band <clears throat> and everybody in town is wanting to grunge it up yeah and, and so they were i think they were surprised and you know encouraged to actually meet someone who knew who green day was <laughs> and who knew you know who knew who the mr t experience you know was and, and that sort of thing so you know, I think we were three of about eight people playing that kind of music in the whole town at that time. Well, real, real quick, do you still have the T-shirt? No, God, no, and Damn I lament dude. that fact. I know, right? Rookie move. <laughs> <laughs> totally young and dumb. I was like, "Fuck, man, he's got to have that like, like, uh, in, <laughs> like, like plexiglass." Yeah, like on the wall or something <clears throat> like that. That's crazy. So, like, no, we... I've... Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, it's okay. So like you guys, you know, you think about this time period, it's it's the it's the nineties where it, it grunge broke up metal and took the complete everything away from that and became the epicenter of everything. And then you guys are in the middle of where that was coming from and we're like, we're gonna play a sound that's completely opposite from that. Yeah, that was pretty smart, right? Like that, that I mean <laughs> that like that's I mean that's pretty punk rock <laughs> hey man I, hey these guys are you know making millions playing music you know yeah. um that shit. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> we're not selling out um yeah that that uh, seems that, that seems pretty accurate i mean i think that we benefited indirectly just from there being such a so much focus on seattle and there being so many places to play and so many people were interested in it um, but we did our best to, you know, be as unsuccessful as possible, um, <laughs> you know, in the midst of all of that stuff that was going on. So when you guys got together, um, you know, so your buddy introduced you guys, you obviously had mentioned to him after he saw your shirt 
hey you're like oh i play drums because my mom made me you know yeah. pick, pick an instrument when i'm a kid and he introduced you to ian and denny so when you guys got together and had your first practice like what was that like well i remember it pretty well uh, i rode my bike over to uh kind of this nasty house that one of them was living in and they had this you know old drum set down in the basement and i just brought my sticks and i remember the first song we ever played was a song called uh, pain in the ass um i think it's a i think it was a bonus track on the very first album okay um but i remember um you know it it seemed pretty easy i mean we sort of uh you know i played fast um that's what those guys were looking for i remember um working out how we began the song so we sort of you know collaborated a little bit and came up with it with a beginning and stuff and um, I remember leaving thinking like, man, I can't believe I found these guys like this is, you know, unlike any other band, um, you know, or, or uh, you know, people around here don't really want to play this music like this is a total, total luck uh, that I ran into these guys. Um, Were you looking? We, uh, no, go on, go on. But, but then we had to wait until I turned 21 so that we could actually go out and play. Oh, really? Thing at the time called the Teen Dance Ordinance, which would let teenagers dance because you know it corrupts your soul um wait and so consequently there were wait, wait, wait. Yep. this is like this is like footloose where like you couldn't it's dance. like footloose it's like footloose you know somehow they came up with this um ordinance that essentially shut down all all ages shows in the city wow. so you could come out here to the east side and there was this one place called the old firehouse it was a a, a teen center and they would put on shows but I think the OK Hotel was the only one of the only places that would put on all ages shows. Wow! Uh, so and it was and it was like that through the you know certainly well into the late '90s. How long were you guys? So when you guys got together and you said you walked out saying I can't believe I found these guys. Were you looking to be in a band or was it something that you just like? Well, I play drums and I just that'd be cool to be in a band. Or were you like I'm I really want to be in a band. You know, I wasn't really looking. I had actually played um, in a couple bands in college that really went nowhere, and I don't think ever even played shows. Um, and so it was sort of something that I was kind of interested in doing, but, you know, I was pretty focused on college at the time. And, uh, you know, my girlfriend. Um, and so it wasn't really something I was actively looking for. But when, you know, when the opportunity came around, I thought, oh, this, you know, be fun. And, Go check that out. Nice. So when you guys, yeah. so what, um, what was the, the first show when you finally turned 21 and could play? Like what was, what, what was that? <laughs> um, well, the first show was, um, a house party up okay. the, up the street from where we practiced. Um, but the first real show was out in Spokane at the airway Heights Grange. And, uh, one of Denny's buddies was doing a, he did a book about Spokane and this was a, uh, <clears throat> like a book release party that he, that he was putting on and had us come out to play. <clears throat> so not even like a real, you know, Hey, we're on a bill at a show. It was more like a, a, a buddy's, you know, uh, a buddy's party. So that was the first one. So like when that happened, like what was, um, how, how many shows in did you guys start to feel like you were getting a bit of a good reception from people? Oh man, I don't know if I remember that. Um, we started really playing in '91, and the first seven inch, I think, that was in like '93. So you know, it took us a good couple years, I think, to like to actually see someone singing your like mouthing the words to one of your songs. I do remember the first time seeing that, and I like I sort of couldn't believe it that yeah. someone actually. <laughs> Like I didn't even know the words to these songs because um, I couldn't hear them. Um, and then to see someone in the audience actually singing it back, I want to say it took a good couple of years of playing to, you know, get to that point. How often were you guys playing? Were you playing every weekend or were you kind of spreading it out because of college and all that? Yeah, we were playing maybe once or twice a month was probably what, what we were doing. That's a, that sounds about. That's right. good. Yeah, it's enough. But, you know, we, um, we all three were, I mean, I think we benefited from all three being into heavy metal as youngsters um, because we sort of took the musicianship and the practicing seriously. And although we were playing punk rock, 
uh, we were trying to do it as well as we could. And so, you know, we practice a couple times a week. Um, and you know, that kind of music to play really well, it <laughs> takes practice and, you know, to get really tight with each other. So, you know, we played a lot, um, you know, looking back on it. Um, but yeah, we'd only play, I think once or twice a month. Of course, when you go on tour, if you don't play, you don't make any money. So we would play, you know, six out of seven days on tour easily. Yeah. Which now seems like I would die. After. I know. I dude. If I mean, we, my old van, like we went on tour like a, like a handful of times, but I'm thinking back now, I'm like, there's no way I could even. Could you imagine? Oh, dude. No. It's It, it gives me like anxiety. <laughs> How, how long it would take you to recover oh man i mean it's just like just being like place to place and in a van just sitting there doing jack shit for 10 hours and then showing up and then waiting like i have to go on at like 10 i want to be fucking in sleep by then like i know you're I know. kidding me um and your diet your diet's terrible oh yeah i mean <laughs> yeah you're just like living off like 7-eleven and the, the whatever the hell is and like the rolling and the uh the hot dog thing or whatever and chips oh my god yeah jo- yeah jojo's and chocolate milk oh god it was the wolf fucking worst i think i were, <laughs> were in our 20s maybe that shit um but like was, when you guys practice did you have like a specific style when you practice where you would would you go through just a solid set and repeat it over and over or would you go through a song and stop in the middle and say hey let's like let's smooth this out or was it just like let's go through it once go smoke some cigarettes, drink some beers, come back in, do it a set again. and be like, all right, we're done. Well, it kind of depended, right? Like, you know, if you're getting ready for a show, we would often practice the set that we were going to play um, just to make sure that, you know, whatever songs um, that we wanted to play, we could play. Um, often, um, you know, you'd work on a song, but we'd probably only play it maybe two or three times and then you'd come back the next time and, and enough repetition, you sort of get to the point where, you figured it all out and it's all been smoothed out and that kind of thing. Um, but then later, you know, I think we had played for so long together and played so many shows at that point that we could just sit down and kind of write out a set list from the, you know, database of, you know, of songs that we had and we could get through most of them. Were you guys um, on the, well. were you guys on the same page of how you wanted the band to be presented live? Because when I heard the band, I, I felt like there was this very, there was, it was kind of like a, a, I don't know if I can say this right. Like there was like a, it, there was a care in what you were doing, but you guys had really good hooks, but there was also kind of a, like a, like I say a snottiness to it, but <laughs> like it kind of well, like, yeah, you know, it's like, it's like a joking aspect, but there was, there was structure to the songs and, and, in in like, um, um, hooks and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, that was a lot less kind of planned than you might think. I mean, I think that was more a product just of our kind of personalities. But that's because... what I'm getting to, because that's what I think it was. You guys weren't trying to get that sound. It was just your personalities that were completely coming out in the sound. Yeah, I mean, there was no kind of, uh, hey, this is sort of how we should present ourselves as show. I mean, there was never any, I don't think we were sophisticated enough to even have that be part of our thinking. Like we were just coming up with these songs and wanted to have a good time playing them. And, you know, it was just sort of a organic, like we just jump around and have a good time while we're playing more than it was kind of considered. Um, but I'm glad it, I'm glad it came off as planned. Oh, or, it totally came off. I mean, like thoughtful. I mean, even when I look at like any of the photos of you guys and the, they're captured on, because when I'm going through Google and I'm looking at, band photos i remember seeing these back then and just thinking like wow these guys are just like super laid back they're just having fun with this and that that's what always drew me to a band i hated the bands that were looking intently in the camera or someone's looking off to the side as everyone's i'm like don't set this up just get a snapshot of you guys just being (laughs) around each other as buddies and that's what i always loved and that's what i got when i saw photos of you guys well, that, yeah, I mean, that's cool. And and I think, um, you know, we were also not trying to make a point or we did, we weren't political. Yeah. We didn't really have any kind of like, it was, you know, if you listen to the, the songs those guys wrote, it's mostly kind of slice of life sort of. Yeah. Almost a meaningless, you know, $80 about an $80 tuner that broke. Um, yeah. 
It was very tongue in cheek almost. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. It was, uh, you know, there was definitely humor was a part of it, but then that's kind of just sort of our outlook in general, I think. Well, it's funny, like jumping in, I'm going to jump back a quick, like real quick, but I remember hearing rehashed and that's like the, that's like with the, the Tom intro and like the dun, 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 yep. dun, yeah, I remember hearing that because I like very melancholy stuff and very, I mean, obviously I said Sunny Day Real Estate before, like I like very moody, melodic stuff. And when I heard that, that was, that's probably one of my favorite sicko songs because it was so, it was like probably the darkest sicko song I think I've ever heard out of the entire catalog you guys have well yeah that's denny for you he sort of had that uh, sort of bittersweet kind of thing going but you know you you sort of get that same vibe out of a song like sprinkler yeah was was always very kind of melancholy and kind of nostalgic um he wrote this song that's on the red seven inch called count me out mm-hmm. which is you know sort of sad and you know it doesn't have any friends poor denny um <laughs> poor denny Poor Danny. Um, no, but, like I didn't, but I was so, con- when I heard that, I was, that's what made me want to go out and get Laugh All You Can, Monkey Boy, because I thought a lot of the songs on there were going to be like that. And it was <laughs> like, and I was like, oh, they're not. But then, you know, then Bad Ears on there, which I think is like one of the, like that and The Sprinkler, I think were like the, you know, the songs that a lot of people will remember. But, oh, yeah. um, but like, I, I would like, I like kind of go off on a tangent, but um, I, I was, I, I just felt like a lot of the songs you guys had were completely opposite. They were just fun and just, you know, like you guys weren't even, you guys, I don't say weren't trying. I feel like that takes away from it, but you were just kind of like, Hey, this is just our, this is the shit we do, you know? And it just, they're really catchy. So. Well, there was definitely, um, you know, not taking yourself too seriously <laughs> was definitely oh, yeah. part of the, you know, part of the thing. And that, that probably came across a little bit as well. How'd you guys get on empty records? Because you basically stayed there through the entirety of the the band until Mutant Pop, unless empty became Mutant Pop. And I just didn't know about that. No, totally, totally different. Okay. Um, so tell me about empty so, records, like how you guys got on. Yeah. That. So, so empty was run by this uh, guy named Blake and um, he was actually friends with Denny's sister, Jill. And they had known each other um, from, I don't know, previous lives or whatever. And um, empty while not, pop punk necessarily at least most of the bands it was more kind of drunk punk okay um but definitely more of a punk rock thing than than what was going on over at sub pop or cz records or or those kind of places so we sort of saw empty as kind of our best chance at getting on a local label just you know from a a fit perspective And, and so this is a true story so jill well so as you might imagine any small label in the early nineties in Seattle was inundated by bands wanting to get put out. Cause it was, you know, it was this hot new, you know, musical center. Oh yeah. So Blake, Blake would just get hundreds of, of cassette tapes. Um, so Jill, and this is a true story, took a bottle of booze over and sat him down and said, we're going to drink and listen to my little brother's band. And that's how, that's how he heard our band. And then, <laughs> And then so he decides he's going to put out a seven inch for us. And um, he got Kurt Block of the Fastbacks fame to to produce it or to record it for us. And um, I was a huge Fastbacks fan, obviously still am. And I remember like thinking like, like, this is it. You know, we've we've made it like, there. There is no higher accomplishment that we will ever have than putting this seven inch out with Kurt Block recording us. I mean, I, I, I thought like, you know, we were going to play the fabulous forum next. I mean, I really thought that that, you know, we'd hit the pinnacle of the most we could ever do. I was just, you know, shocked that it had come together like that. Um, but that's, that's how it went. Was it, did you feel like it was, I mean, granted it was about what, two years after you guys formed when this happened or a year? Yeah, a couple of years. Um, you know, we had put out a self-funded uh, four band seven inch and two of the bands decided after we, you know, pressed them that they weren't going to pay for it. Oh, that's so it was, you know, it was totally typical, you know, small band stuff. So, you know, we had tried, um, you know, to put out our own seven inches, but we just didn't have the the notoriety, you know, because back then, you know, you would see a band on the same label as some band you liked and you're like, well, I'm going to pick this up just because it's on this label. That was like, the, that was the thing back then. I mean, that was, that was your gateway of, 
well, this yeah. band is on this label. I guess more bands on this label will sound like that. And then you get like 10 records and two out of the two out of the 10 are the one you wanted. And the other ones are like, oh, what the? I can't believe they put this out. Like, what the <laughs> fuck is this? <laughs> I think we were I think we were that band on empty because if you know, if you were into the derelicts and then thought you were going to get the same stuff out of sicko, you're probably pretty disappointed. Yeah, I was like, what the shit? <laughs> yeah, this is this isn't drunk at all. <laughs> How did you guys come across the the artwork? Because all of your CDs are basically drawn, or they all are drawn, and you yeah. have a very specific logo of the name. So did that all come up? Because that came from the first the first record. You can feel the love for seven inch. So this again, like I often think that um, we sort of did a lot of stuff right um, unwittingly with Sicko. Like we sort of didn't know. So the story is, is it's this local cartoon artist named Jason Lutz, who was um, a friend, I think, of Denny's girlfriend at the time. Um, and he did this great um, uh, cartoon called Jar of Fools. And so we convinced him to do this seven inch for, uh, for us. He came up with those, with the Sicko, you know, the characters or whatever. He came up with the logo we had literally, I think, no input into what he was doing other than, um, you know, here's an example. So he, when he did the art, you know, he did the cellophane layovers, you know, it wasn't digital back then. So he was actually doing the layovers for the different colors for the printer. Oh yeah. And, um, the, the cellophane itself was red. We actually wanted the seven inch to be blue, <laughs> but because this, the cellophane was red, the printer just made them red. Like that was how little we had, you know, how little control we had in, what, in, in our final product. That's um, so funny, man. That yeah, hits, yeah. So, sticks. you know, and now and now we call it the red seven inch, um, but it was supposed to have been a blue seven inch. <laughs> uh, so he came up with all that, and then he did the um, first album. So you can feel love in this room. That's he did that one as well, um, and then Denny's sister did the monkeys. Okay. And then, and then this guy named Pablo did Chef Boy, Are You Dumb? And then Joe Newton of Gas Huffer fame did You're Not the Boss of Me. Oh, wow. I didn't realize you had different uh, artists. Yeah, it was, it, it was different artists. But, um, you know, it just sort of set like Jason Lutz just sort of set the tone. And then we just continued it because we had no better idea. I mean, it kind of made sense because you guys were from – from what I'm hearing and like the sound is like, you guys are kind of a bunch of characters <laughs> in a sense, <laughs> you know, I mean, just like three dudes who were just kind of just like, whatever. I felt like the artwork really encompassed who you guys were, even though like the, the logo or the sickle logo is very sharp and jagged. It's, it's still almost like a tongue in cheek version. It like, I feel like it goes, cause I'm in, I'm, I'm, I'm in a gra- I've been a graphic designer for like a while. So I look at things and visuals to me match the tone of, what something is like the branding or whatever yeah and, uh, but i felt like it really just like came across um it, like to really represent you guys pretty well or very yeah well. i mean i mean i think it did but i assure you that was not planned it, you know it was not like some kind of uh you know uh corporate plan it wasn't like a we band meeting where you guys were like no, all right what's no. to do no it it was like hey jason's gonna do our seven inch like oh hey that's really cool you know we should make a t-shirt out of that and it just kind of worked out that it really did, you know, fit our band and it became kind of this, you know, it helps that it's a very distinctive looking kind of design that he did. Yeah, um, totally. And um, yeah, so it's actually uh, actually really cool. And in fact, I will, um, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to tell this to your listening audience. Um, you can say whatever you we're want, gonna, Josh. We'll say whatever. We're, we're going to release a um, or kind of a retrospective, kind of a compilation of uh, old sicko songs and we got jason to come back and do the cover of oh that's this one. fucking awesome yeah so yeah. that'll be out i think uh, kind of september time frame on uh red scare records oh about it wait red scare that's uh brendan kelly and toby yes yeah. yeah 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 they actually um you know quite a few years now uh ago um, Toby re-released all of our stuff digitally, so that's how we ended up on iTunes and Spotify and all that stuff. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, actually, I yeah. just uh, interviewed Brendan. Um, man, like fifteen, yeah. fifteen, whatever. Like, yeah, the last tour we went on was with his uh, old band, or well, still a band, Lawrence Arms. I guess like mm-hmm. I, I, I guess they're still. So, are you still playing? 
No, I um, we played. We did actually did a reunion show last year because the podcast kind of got some people reminiscing about the Jersey scene. So that was cool. We ended up putting our, our first record out on vinyl, which was super fucking awesome. I got to <laughs> just design that, and we did like an etching and stuff. So it, it's cool when you can. Because there's like people are really remembering this time period, and it's cool that there's all these bands playing these reunion shows and then doing these re-releases. Because you can, due to the whole digital thing, you know, it's really just if you have the masters, you can host it somewhere, and then it just shoots it off to Spotify and all these other places where people can download it and and, and buy it and things like that. Yeah. Which is yeah. Cool. I mean, there's a there's a whole thriving pop punk scene up here in Seattle now. It's crazy to see. So when, like, and I, I want to actually talk about that um, in in a bit. But when you guys, so you guys put out, you could feel the love in this room. Did you guys tour, start touring on that, or on Co- Count Me Out? Well, we would do kind of small regional trips, like maybe down the coast to San Francisco and L.A. and back, or you know, out to Spokane and back, and that sort of thing. But yeah. Uh, you can feel the love in this room was the first time that we <laughs> attempted a, uh, a national tour. Um, and you know, it's like a, it's a total fiasco. Most of the time, um, nobody knew who we were, um, played with metal bands. Most of the time, I remember our tour manager, um, gave us directions coming from the opposite direction. So we're like driving down the road and we start seeing exits that are on our paper, but, from, you know, out of order and, you know, no cell phones, no digital maps. I mean, it's just us and our Thomas guy trying to find our way. So, um, <laughs> it's pretty, that was done, man. That is how it was done. Yeah. It was how it was done. First day of tour was showing up to a gas station, buying a, a map of the United States. If you didn't have the previous <laughs> one and, That's uh, right. the, you know, you wanted the updated one. So when you're driving the exits were still the same or they hadn't changed anything <laughs> in developing it the is, highways. Yeah. It's inconceivable now that you would actually venture out of your house without a, a route, you know, pre-planned for you. But I guess we did it. Oh my God. I have like my map up on my phone where I'm going to like three blocks away to a bar. I'm just like, okay, wait a minute, <laughs> yeah. please yeah. take me there. Take yeah, me there. Exactly. iPhone. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what, um, so when you guys were, so the, I mean, again, like anyone, you know, listening, I mean, this, this is like, this is like 94. So, yeah, you know, 94, 95, that's when we did most of it, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, this is the time period when, I mean, what was it? Was Green Day even, was Dookie even out at this point, or were you a couple Dookie years wasn't ago? out. No, Dookie wasn't out, so they had had that, um, what is it, the 1039? Yeah, 10,000 tap happy. Yeah, 39 happiness. smooth or whatever it was. Yeah. They had that, and then um, Kerplunk came out. Yep. And... At that point, you know, they were I remember hearing stories of them driving around with, you know, sixty thousand dollars in cash in their van because they were making so much money on their tour. Um, but, yeah, Dookie was I guess we could look it up on the Internet, but I think it was a little bit after that because, you know, Green Day was um, um, just another I mean, they were successful, but they were just another band in the scene. Um, I had a brother who played in the Mr. T experience okay. and, you know, we, we would go see green day open for them. I mean, like the Mr. T experience was the bigger band at the time. Yeah. Cause look out and all that. Um, yeah. Cause look lookout and all that. So yeah, actually it says February 1st, 94. So you guys that, the, yeah. So that was, uh, you guys did put that out the same year when yep. that started getting big. So, which is like, which is so crazy because I mean, again, we going back to the beginning when we're talking about the Seattle scene. I mean, that was the grunge scene in the early '90s, and that was this huge thing. So when punk, I was listening to the No Effects book the other day. Do you get a chance? Have you ever heard that at all? The no, no, I haven't. It is fucking amazing if just to hear <laughs> how how fucked up these guys were and their the stories from back then it's 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 amazing but they they talk about that era a lot when like nirvana came out and they were thinking oh shit like this is really going to help us and then when dookie came out they were like we are at the perfect place at the perfect time and i think a lot of bands thought that when they were trying to make something like kind of a hey i just want to do this full time you know yeah. so like and then and- and, and then they figure out there is only one green day. Yeah. You're like, oh, wait, so, they, they, they had the spot. Shit. Yeah, man, that's not our band. <laughs> did you guys, like, did you guys want to, you know, you're going out on tour and you're putting out records and, 
you know, did you guys have a band meeting at one point and say like, all right, we really let's let's go for it, or it was, ah, eh, this is kind of fun, like kind of like the tone of the band, like yeah, we kind of go out and we come home and do some shit, and we kind of go out whenever we want. Like, what was the direction that you guys had an agreement on? Well, uh, again, it was much more organic than you you know than maybe it appeared. Um, you know, you remember when Jawbreaker signed and they did Dear You. Yeah. You know, the, the, the don't sell out vibe was, you know, you could taste it. I mean, it was such a big deal in our scene to not sell out. Um, and I think we all kind of, you know, and in retrospect, it's kind of a stupid attitude. Um, I will say that we definitely had that attitude of not wanting to sell out. But then I would also say that there, there wasn't a lot of people buying so it's not like we were turning down record contracts or anything. Um, at the same time, we weren't really trying. But so, did you guys like? Did you guys? Okay, so it was like, what was like the the um not the day by day, but we, you know, you guys go out and tour and come back. Where it was, was it just we go out on tour? You know, we book it ourselves. We go on go out on tour for a couple weeks and we come back home and we work some jobs and then we just kind of go out again or was it more, Hey, when we get home, let's get, let's get out again because we want to just kind of be on the road a lot. I think, um, those guys probably wanted to tour, uh, more than I did. Um, I was sort of more of the stay at home, you know, kind of attitude. Um, no, it was not like, uh, you know, remember the band pop defect, like those guys would tour, you know, 10 months out of the year. Okay. Um, I remember hearing about uh, the descendants decided to live in somewhere like in Missouri because it was more central for touring. You know, so, <laughs> yeah, so makes sense. There was, yeah, I mean, uh, we were never like that. Um, so, uh, no, it was much more kind of laid back. Um, all of our tours were um, based around, you know, releasing albums and that kind of thing. So it was never, uh, you know, because ha- we'd have to come back from tour and get jobs again. Yeah. Um, so it was, uh, it was quite a lift to, I mean, half the time you'd move out of where you were living cause you couldn't make rent while you were gone or whatever. Um, and then have to come back and put it all together. So, it was, uh, there was an effort to it, uh, which I think prevented us from, you know, doing it a, a whole bunch. Now, like, how did you guys come up with the whole theme? Um, cause I've read that you guys, when you played, you were one song after the other so you'd have a 20 song set or or it was a 20 it was like 15 songs and it would take you 40 minutes but it'd be one song right into the next and then ian and denny would switch off and play each other's oh man i wish that were true those guys would tune so much in between i don't know what i don't know what the point of being in tune is but they were very (laughs) focused on being in tune so like I would watch like the Mr. T experience and they would have, you know, one song into the next song into the next song and then they would pause and, you know, a little banter and then they play three songs in a row. I don't think we ever got to that that point. Um, but it is true that, uh, you know, the songs that, say, Denny would write, he would sing and play guitar on. And then the songs that Ian would write, he would play guitar and sing on. So we would do half a set of one guy and then switch in the middle and half a set, and then we would alternate who would play first. Did you ever kind of how it worked? Did you ever get up and play guitar or bass when they played and they play drums? No, um, there is. Um, so there's a song on Laugh While You Can, Monkey Boy, called "What's On" at the very end. Yeah, it's very slow. I played bass on that, and Ian played drums. Did you ever play that um, live like that? You know, maybe, but I feel very uncomfortable standing up there in front of a bunch of people. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, it was never a regular thing. What, like, what was, do you remember any one of like one of the craziest shows you guys had on, on tour? <clears throat> I mean, it, it's a very broad question. Cause that could be a fight could have broken out or you had like 2000 people for some random reason. But like for you, like what stood out to you is one of the craziest. Like well, there's a few. So I will say that um, you can feel the love in this room is uh, came from a real show <clears throat> at this place called the Ho Down Center in Richland, Washington. And, um, you know, we were right in the middle of playing and a fight broke out and they took it outside and like the entire room emptied as we were playing. <laughs> and we sort of didn't know what was going on. Like all of a sudden everyone's leaving. And I think Danny even, you know, leaned over and said, boy, you can really feel the love in this room. 
<clears throat> so things like that would happen. Um, I think the most amazing shows were uh, we toured Japan a couple times, oh, wow. and we played we played with this band called Husking Bee. You ever heard of them? No. You should check them out. Okay. Um, really, you know, really melodic uh, Japanese punk rock, and they were huge over there. And so they would sell out. Like we had a three night sold out stand at this club um, in Tokyo. And they'd, you know, they'd attract 800 people. And I mean, we'd never played in front of people like that. So those shows probably stand out to me as some of the best shows we ever played. Um, and then there was a show at Coney Island High in New York City that for, I don't know why, but several hundred people showed up to see us. And it's uh, it was insane. But I think probably one of the craziest things that ever happened was, um, and I hope this isn't a family podcast. No, it's definitely not. Uh, but we were playing in Vancouver, British Columbia with Cub. Do you remember that band? It's um, And uh, so we're playing and this guy gets up on stage and pulls his pants down and starts pouring beer down the crack of his ass and then kind of half-heartedly attempted to stick the beer bottle up his butt and then decided better of it and um, <laughs> threw it into the audience, at which point it was like the parting of the Red Sea. You know, <laughs> nobody wanted to get hit with this soiled bottle. Um, <laughs> I just I, I just sort of couldn't believe it. Oh, and there was another show. <laughs> so, this, so my wife, bless her heart, um, doesn't take any shit. And um, we're playing a show at the Crocodile Cafe. And I'm playing and I look out and I see her facing off with some dude like you know he probably bumped into her or spilled his drink on her or something and i see her like with this beer bottle like cocked and ready to bash over this guy's head and i remember playing the song and sort of like calmly thinking to myself you know am i gonna have to stop playing in the middle of this song to go and you know intervene in my in my wife's confrontation uh, but happily <laughs> I happily can't. i did I can't imagine this happening at a sicko show. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know where that guy came. He, he probably thought he was coming to see the derelicts. Yeah, it's like I don't see you guys really uh, uh, bringing out that emotional side of people where they're like, "I'm gonna be. I'm just gonna just rage right now." Like, yes, no. There was not a lot of raging. That's you're right. <laughs> it was unusual. That's why it stands out, right? So for some bands, it would be like, "Oh, that happens every night." Um. I actually, uh, yeah. So we're at, we're about an hour. I want to make sure that you're cool with time. I don't wanna, you know. No, we're be, good. Okay, cool. Um, so like when you guys were, you know, coming back and recording all the like the other albums, like you know, when you guys did like Bad Year and The Sprinkler and all that, did you guys c- kind of have an idea that those songs were standing out and you know would be the songs that people were really, you know, gonna remember? I mean, it, it's kind of it's a broad question to be like, you know, years later yeah. that, but like when you did them, we were like fuck man that's a good song this is this is this is yeah. catchy i mean i you know you would get some idea from playing shows and which ones people responded to um <clears throat> and i certainly had you know the ones that i liked and thought were better songs um you know sprinkler was by far the most like if people came up and said hey will you play this song tonight it was always the sprinkler yeah and and i i certainly didn't um kind of foresee that 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 was going to be sort of the big one on the record. And it's like, you know, that six or seventh song on it's buried on the first side of one of these records. So no, I don't think we, um, we had that sense. Um, but I also think sometimes like you record a song and I think that song is like that. And I think bad year is like it where it's sort of the best time you ever played it. And it sort of gets this quality that you didn't necessarily try to get, but somehow everything kind of came together and it just sort of worked. Um, and those songs, I don't know, like I sometimes, you know, listen to those songs and I wonder if I, if we ever played it better than what was on the record. <laughs> Certainly if you look at, you know, live shows, we didn't. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, there's a lot of lot, lot going on in a live show. You're not really concentrating on the music all that much. Um, was there any other songs that you thought that you just, you loved playing live that weren't, where people typically didn't, think of that as like a standout song but you you enjoyed it like playing it a lot you know it's more the opposite where people liked it and i didn't like to play them Hmm. you know because they're too fast or whatever okay 
So like, <coughs> excuse me. It's okay. Like, but like, were there were there any songs though that you wanted to play more of that you guys just chose not to? Um, because you guys have a lot of fucking songs. We have a lot of songs. Yeah. No, I, no, I don't know if I could think of any. Um, I mean, the ones that you think are the hits are the ones that people like. You know, where I live is a great song to play. Super fun. Super straightforward. You know, hits all the punk rock check boxes. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. Just like you personally, where you were like, you Me guys go on tour, like, oh man, I really love playing this song. No. You're no, like, no, I don't I like I, any of the songs. <laughs> I, no, I, no, I mean, I liked them all. I mean, those they're fun songs to play. Um, at this point, you know, I'm a little old for that, and they're hard. <laughs> it's, it's a young man's <laughs> sport, but, um, you know. No, they're they're good songs. Are there any? No, I can only think of the ones that I didn't like to play. Okay. We don't need to talk about that. That's okay. I don't want to ruin anyone. They're like, they're like, what the fuck, man? I love this song. You're like, yeah. Well, so they want to they want to play like two super fast ones back to back. Oh and yeah. I need a break, man. Yeah. Catch my. That's how you do it, man. You make the set. You start off strong, and then you level it out in the middle with some slow songs or kind of bring it down just so the drummer and people, the band members can be like, all right, we can fucking breathe now. And then, uh, Well, and there's a, there's, a, there's a real trick when you're a drummer that there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong on a drum set that might need tightening. And so you pretend that you're like messing with your hi-hat, you know, like, oh, there's something wrong with my hi-hat, but really I'm just catching my breath. Ah, interesting. It's a, it's a drummer trick. I feel like my drummer Sean probably did that plenty of times. Where I'd look back, I'm like, "You don't need to move your tom anymore. It's close enough." Like he's like, "Dude, I'm gonna pass out if I don't spend 30 seconds adjusting this tom." Oh my god! It's just like you saying how the, you know Ian and Tenny were constantly tuning. I actually, I'm surprised you were you were bummed about that because it sounds like you wanted some breathing, you know, some breathing room. Yeah. You're like, oh, thank God that E sounds yeah, flat no, I mean, right that's, now. That's probably true. <laughs> Um, how did you guys, uh, so I know you mentioned at the beginning, but like, talk about like meeting Alan, like the number one sicko fan in the entire existence of sicko. How did we meet Alan? Well, I remember, I think he was in touch with us. Um, cause you know, he, he worked at his uh, record store flip side. and yeah, flip side. And I think, uh, he and Ian had kind of contacted each other. And then when we were out there on tour, that's when we actually like, met him in person and stayed at his house and he showed us his sicko tattoo oh wow where is where is that is that his arm yeah it's amazing i hope <laughs> <laughs> yeah he wouldn't show us he wouldn't show us the um, sicko tattoo. i don't know he but then <laughs> we weren't dating at the time <laughs> um, um yeah but he was just one of these you know he's one of these guys who is uh you know super enthusiastic and really into our band which was not a common you know, you just don't run into people who are super passionate um, about your your stuff. Uh, and he was one of them. It was pretty. Uh, that's the thing. That's why when Alan recommended recommended you guys is why it stood out to us, because he's not a guy that, the, the you know, especially me, because it was like my friends are really into a lot of punk bands and I was not. So to impress my friends, that was a giant feat. <laughs> And then <laughs> to have like to watch them try to impress Alan and Alan dismiss them, I was really paying attention to that because he he was just like, Yeah, I don't you know, fuck that band. Or we were like, Oh, it's the best band ever. He's like, Really? And when someone did that who was older than us, like he was like I think like three or four years older than us, um, there was something to that. And so when he when he would geek out over a band, we really would pay attention. And, oh, meant something, yeah. Yeah, because you're like, wait, if this guy can't, like, it's hard to get him to crack on anything. And watch his excitement talking about, again, like, he would talk about Zoinks, Jill, um, who else did he talk Who would, you know, like, Jimmy World, when Static Prevails came out, he introduced us to that, and these different bands. But when he, and he talked about you guys, so what, that's what why we would really pay attention. To the, and I think that's why all these bands, especially you guys, became so big to us because he was super stoked on it so we're like we really gotta pay attention to this there's something yeah. here there, you know then we then some of the bands he would recommend i was like eh, i don't know i'm not like a big fan of but like when you when i heard you guys i was like oh man like i, I fucking you know I, I, I dig this shit like i'm yeah because i'm listening to like deftones and stuff back then which i'm you know whatever i'm not a, i'm not ashamed well, yeah i mean <laughs> i had a similar you know as i said a similar relationship with my brother where he would say 
hey man, check out these bands. And it, you know, it meant more than just one of my dumb friends saying it. Yeah. Um, just cause I respected, you know, his opinion and he knew a lot more about it and, you know, was in the scene and all that. So yeah, I mean, that was the deal. Find people who you trust or labels that you like. And that was your pathway into the music. Yeah. There was like a respect to it. You're like, okay, I yeah. trust this. Um, when you guys, so like, you know, years later you guys do, you know, you're not the boss of me. And so Tell me about how that transitioned over. So at this point, you guys went from doing one, two, three, four. So you did four records on empty records, which seemed like obviously you had a good relationship yep. with them up into that point. And not saying that it wasn't yep. a bad relationship going to Mutant Pop, but like, how did you guys transition off of that into going into doing your last record on Mutant Pop? Well, we well that was sort of a, it was really kind of an afterthought. So the band pretty much had wrapped up by the time that mutant pop thing came out and it was kind of a um like this the last part of that is what was supposed to have been the last live show um and you know tim from mutant pop was just a fan of the band and you know i remember um you know he sort of considered putting out records as sort of the highest form of collecting records which i always thought was an interesting perspective but he just contacted us um because we had put out a seven inch i think with uh song called 3t on it yep um and he was like hey you know do you guys want um put out sort of a, a an outtake and a collection of, of songs and let's do a record together so that was sort of a almost a posthumous kind of release um as i remember it so um it wasn't sort of like leaving one label to go to another i think we had pretty much wrapped the band up and then he just kind of came around and said you know let's do this project so you guys were done at this point. You had just decided yeah. after years, because this was like 2000 when you guys did that. And yeah. And you put out, uh, you can feel the love in this room in 94. So you're six years into the run. And at this point, you guys are just like, you know, I think, so what were you in your early 20s at this point? Late 20s. Late so 20s. yeah, I would say yeah, by 98, 99, you know, I was 27, 28 kind of age. Those guys were a little older. I think Ian's a year, Denny's two years older. So we were, we were coming up on 30. And when you're in your late twenties, you think that's pretty old. I know. It's so funny. <laughs> and, you know, we had had, um, situations like, you know, I'd be playing this, this all ages show and some kid would come up to me and say, Hey, you work with my mom. <laughs> and they, and they point at the records and they'd say, is that a poster? Um, so we sort of had this sense that like, um, you know, and then you'd go to Japan and they were super into it and you'd play to all these huge shows. Cause obviously we were playing with a really successful band and then we'd come back here and play to 10 people again. And you know, the parallels between our band and Spinal Tap really became palpable mm -hmm. that we just sort of felt like, well, we can keep doing this same thing. Like nothing was going to change. We would still you know, and not that it was bad necessarily, but it just sort of had run its course. I remember feeling, um, I kind of regret at this point that we didn't just kind of put it on hold and, you know, we sort of made a point to break up, which is kind of stupid. Um, in retrospect, you know, we could have just decided like, Hey, let's just not do this for a couple of years. I think um, a lot of bands feel that, or they're seeing that now. Cause I think a band breaking up is, is the stupidest thing ever because, you know, even Jawbreaker now, they just go. And you guys got back together, what, a couple years ago? And a couple years ago, yeah. Yeah, I saw the uh, uh, there, were, there was a video on YouTube where you guys were playing live. Yeah. And I mean, I I think that to say you're completely broken up, I think a lot of bands are realizing that that's it's fucking dumb because they they'll say that it's concrete, and now they're realizing, even a decade later or a couple years later, that they'll play a show and they feel almost weird to, to do that because yeah. they made such a declaration that it was over and final. But I think even seeing Jawbreaker get back together, open up a lot of doors for people are going, well, he was really adamant about them not doing that. And they're, <laughs> now they're like, they're like, we're on our fifth tour now. They seem pretty angry at each other <laughs> at the time. Um, oh yeah. I mean, yeah, they definitely seem kind of pissed off. Yeah. But. I mean, I don't, I don't know what, like a public declaration of like, we're going to break up. I don't know what that does, like what useful service that provides. I it does know. nothing. I mean, it's all you know, well, exactly. It's ego. It's just, it's pure. Like I'm making, you know, cause we're, I mean, if you're in a band, you have some kind of a, an, a, 
an artistic sense or there's some emotional shit going on there where it's all poetic and bullshit you know so yeah yeah i mean i think we got pissed off at each other and you know decided uh we'd had enough like did you guys what was the inner what was the inner um you know for six years being on the road and stuff like what was the um uh, the inner dialogue what am i trying to think say here like the how did you guys get along you know, we got along pretty well. I think um, we had our moments. Um, I think all of us, you know, have aspects of our personality that are annoying. We did have a sit down at one point early in the band and we're like, look, you guys, you know, if we don't get along, this band is going to be over. And this was before, this was probably in the first year or two of the band. That's the only time that I can remember, like really having to sit down and sort of <laughs> have an intervention with each other. Yeah. But, you know, we'd get pissed off. I mean, we'd get angry at each other. But it's sort of like, you know, I mean, maybe this is cliche to say, but like you could be pissed off at your brother, but he's still your brother. Yeah. <clears throat> That's sort of how it got to with us. Like, yeah, we could get pissed off with each other, but we're still in this band together. Um, and so I think we actually got along, you know, for the most part, pretty well. Yeah. It's like. We can get pissed at each other, but we still have to see each other every Christmas. So <laughs> Yeah, and I still have to play that show with you next weekend, so I better not be too pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool, man. Well, let me, let me see. Um, yeah, how, like, how did you guys officially break up? You know, I knew you were going to ask me that, <clears throat> and I'm trying to remember. Uh-huh. Um, I, think, I, think, um, I think Ian and I got in some sort of argument with Denny. And Denny, uh, you know, was like, well, fuck, you know, fuck this. Like, you know, maybe we just quit or whatever. And we're like, oh, yeah, OK, we're, you know, it's over. I think it, it was something I don't even remember. It's it was so dumb and long ago. 19 years ago. I know. Right. It's crazy. And did you guys ever play any shows like when you guys broke up? Because you all stayed in Washington in like pretty much around the same place that like not too far from Seattle. Right. Yeah, um, Ian spent some time uh, getting a graduate degree at Oxford, <clears throat> and then he's moved back since then. So yeah, we're all we're all still in the area. What brought you guys back together a couple years ago to play uh, to play out? Well, it was Ian's pop punk festival. So you know he did this little uh, record label called Top Drawer Records back in the day, and he released um, back then an album called Thirteen Soda Punks P U N X. It was a compilation of 13 punk rock bands. And back then, I think only two or three of them were from Seattle. Like he had to go to Vancouver and um, the Bay Area to get enough bands to fill up his compilation. Um, And so I don't know if he's had like a midlife crisis recently, but he decided that um, he's going to start the label back up. And so he released a couple years ago another follow-up compilation called... 14 soda punks and amazingly all 14 of these bands are seattle bands so that gives you an idea of uh the you know the difference in in how many pop punk bands there are now yeah and so he decided as kind of a record release thing to do a seattle pop punk festival and have all of those bands play over a couple nights so he called us up and he's like hey you know would you guys consider and he's being totally diplomatic and you know kind of political about it um (laughs) You know, we, could, we we only have to play, you know, two or three songs. We don't even have to, you know, publicize it. No big deal, whatever. And I thought, you know, I haven't played the drums in 15 years. Like, it's going to take so much effort to be able to play those songs again. I'm not going to put in the effort to just play two or three songs. So I was like, hey, you know, let's just practice up, play a full set. It'll be kind of, you know, a cool reunion thing for the for the pop punk festival. So that's that's what we did, but that's really why it was just to support Ian and his uh, and his uh, record label. How'd you guys like it? Like, how'd you guys enjoy the shows? The show? It was pretty sweaty. <laughs> no, it was actually really fun. It was it was great. To, I mean, I, I I practiced by myself for uh, a month wow. just to be able to play those songs again. Um, but love playing with those guys They're You know, it's super fun. It was great to play those songs again. Um, 
And then so many people came from such crazy distances. I was going to ask you that. Like, what was like a crazy distance that someone came from? Well, Alan, Alan came from, you know, New Jersey. Yeah. Uh, we had people from Denver, Texas, California. I mean, people flew in to come to this pop punk festival. So, you know, it's not all sicko drawing them in. Um, but uh, it was it was pretty amazing. And, and what's so crazy about playing now, um, especially, you know, when sicko goes out, it's like all the people from the scene who y- you might not have seen for a decade, like they all show up and we're all a little older and we're all a little fatter. But for a moment, you know, it's the it's the same people and the same band and the same music in the same space as you used to be. And it's a uh, it's pretty fun. Yeah, it's it, it's it's something wild about that. It's, it, it is a different vibe because back then it was just really baggy clothed punk kids or whatever you know whatever style they were just sitting there with their arms crossed they didn't know you and if they knew you they were going nuts and then now it's they sit there and just like raise their beers in the air and don't really move yeah. but they sing the songs back to you but they sing the songs and they and they're glad that it's over at 10 30 yeah oh man that's like the biggest thing that everyone's like oh the man the band's going out at nine what yeah yeah fuck yeah. we'll start the show at four I'm going to have to pace myself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, all right. So a couple more questions to let you go. Uh, what is the picture? Is this you with a British flag shirt on in this doorway? No, that is uh, Frank from the Mr. T experience. Okay. I was like, what, what do you, what's the story behind that? That, uh, that shirt was left over from when uh, my brother and I were into Def Leppard and we actually had uh, sl- sleeveless Union Jack shirts that we had bought in uh, on Carnaby Street in London. Amazing. And and that is Frank wearing my brother's Union Jack shirt. That's like what um, the drummer used to wear before he lost his arm. It was the singer. Wait a minute, Joe, no, Elliott. That, 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 Joe Elliott. Did he really? The, dr- the drummer would wear. Uh, I, and I can't believe I know this, but like Union Jack boxers. Yeah, Joe Elliott was the one who wore the sleeveless uh, Union Jack shirt. Yes, I, yeah, I, you know, I completely remember that too. Um, <laughs> what's the picture that you guys have where you're holding shotguns? Oh yes, um, so there was a brief moment where um, I was a gun owner, and uh, those are we just decided to sort of, I, I guess, Pulp Fiction was kind of. Uh, present in our consciousness at the time and so that was us doing our best imitation of pulp fiction that's amazing (laughs) (laughs) those those are real guns that's awesome they're like are they loaded no no and we had great trigger discipline oh god yeah i don't know anything about that a gun scare the fuck out of me uh yeah i don't i don't have any anymore (laughs) cool man well um i'll wrap this up because it is well actually it's like 618 for you so because you're you're three hours behind, but it's bedtime. I it's, yeah, it's bedtime. <laughs> bedtime. God damn, six o'clock. Um, so okay. Um, so before we go, I have two more questions, and um, okay. I'll I'll this one at the, before the final one. But um, what would you like to plug? Uh, well, I would say um, the sickos have. Uh, so Ian has a great new band called The Subjunctives. And um, they just put out an EP on Top Drawer Records. So I would say uh, check that out. And then I would also say uh, check out um, my and Denny's band uh, with his wife called The Drolls. And we have a single out on um, Top Drawer Records. Uh, I actually didn't play on it, but, you know, buy it anyway. Um, And then I would also say uh, if anybody has not checked out The Beths, definitely check out The Beths. Okay. And the last question is, what scene ethics do you still hold on to to this day? Uh, I really try not to be an asshole. It's a daily, it's a daily effort. You know, I have to continually remind myself. You know, there's, I usually it will end it there, but so many people have said the same thing. It's so funny (laughs) that that is like the the common thread of how people are like just don't be a dick yeah just behave well that's all i mean it really if you know if more people did that right it would uh it'd make a big difference but i think that's you know just be cool i mean you know the attitude uh just uh never does anyone any good 